All right, it is 6.30 and um, the meeting is a, a officially called to order. We have a, a pretty broad agenda to go through today, as, as always. Um, we'll take care of some business very quickly, finalizing board elections. And I'd like to spend a minute on our vision and focus, and then you'll hear from a number of the board members on um, the specific areas that we're working on. Then we'll unveil the NARB Top 25 for 2013 award the NARG Riders Grant, the election results, and answer any questions that you might have. Um, as you know, the, um, the Board of Directors of the North American Riders Group has representatives from Canada, the United States, Mexico, active um, high performance members in, in our sport that are engaged in both um, this organization as well as uh, the Federation on various committees, both on the National Federation and the International um, Federation or the National affiliate. And you, you can see that group and they keep me, um, even though I'm only in the masters, because I help keep things moving along. Uh, we go through an election process. We try to be as fair as, as possible to have um, new representation and rotation. So we elect a third of the board each year. And for those of you who've heard me say that before, I'll, I'll do this part quickly. But So we, we elect a third, a third, a third, um, and they're each elected for a three-year term. And this year we are um, putting up for re-election McLean Ward, Jimmy Toronto, and Norman De La Joya. De La Joya and we have um, are putting up for the first time for election um, with Missy e. Clark. And Missy e. joined us um, waiting for this election a few months ago, but fills an important spot in the board, um, having developed many riders for the Grand Prix ranks, but um, also involved with young riders, junior jumpers, et cetera, um, and a developer of, of top talent. So, um, we hope you elect her and, and look forward to her participation. So, if you um, had a chance, we put out the opportunity for you to vote online when you walk through the door. But if there is any member here that has not had a chance to vote yet and would like to, I can have a ballot brought to you. Is there anybody who still needs to vote? Right here, you guys. Tiffany, too. Take a second. So we, okay. so is, is there four spots? Yes, you're you're up or down for for these four. Nominations have closed a, a while back. So you either vote for them or or you can withhold anyone. And Jen, did you get the tip? You need to grab those. Meadows, we won all three of the, the major ones during the, the summer tournament. 
Um, and that, I'm not just talking about the United States. In, in Canada, we had representation, made the final round in Barcelona, um, and had a top placing in those finals. And, and, and I believe that North American sport has, is on a positive trend. More importantly, I think you also see it in, in, in sort of the energy at home and in the improvement. And I'm proud of what the NAR Top 25 has accomplished. Is it always perfect? No, it's not always perfect. We get it right every time or every piece. But as a result of it, you know, there's been this improvement where things are getting better. People care and they like seeing their name on it. Um, as we prepare, you know, to be in that ranking and there's better footing going in across um, events. There's prize money. There's now a million and a half dollar event for a single Grand Prix in Spruce the coming year. There's multiple million dollar events. There's young rider championships events and, and tours being sponsored and going across and representing us overseas. So, you know, I feel like things are, are heading the right direction, but we've got a lot of work still to do. So, it's an important vision and one we work at all the time. Peter Leone asked me the other day, um, you know, tell me what are the top three things, you know, what are you working on other than my rules? Let, let me tell you what, um, from this organization standpoint, what we think the top three priorities are right now. And I group them into big categories. The first one is clean sport without, without unintended consequences. So we try to be get the writer of advocacy when things like whether you know about it or not, the FBI reaches out around the world, and we'll, each of the board members or a number of the board members will talk about these specifically, but we want to make sure that North America has a voice um, when things are being discussed at the FBI. Um, an example of that, you know, there's rules being designed on high boots that can affect performance of horses, and, you know, if too draconian of changes in rules can have unintended consequences. We'll talk about that. Um, you know, all in great spirit of trying to keep people safe. There's been a bunch of vaccination rules independently developed by a number of organizers, but when you put them all together, they're not necessarily good for the, for the horses. So first area is we fully support clean sport, but it's got to have rider and owner and trainer input where there can be negative unintended consequences. The second is the balance of power between organizers and customers. And if you hear me say that that means that we're trying to hurt organizers, you're not listening. We want organizers to be successful and make a lot of money, but there needs to be balance. And we have concerns as, as riders. Um, we believe the mileage rule needs to be modified. We'll, we'll talk about that. Not thrown out and eliminated, but collectively a solution that allows for competition and um, prevents things like monopolistic pricing. There's rules that we believe need further development on. There's penalties, inconsistent penalties that we need to be dealt with, and ultimately, constantly pushing for improving show standards. And, and third, we fundamentally believe that the system in North America has to encourage growth. So again, you know, it's easy to, to hear us push or talk about things like, you know, the prize money needs to escalate in order to encourage people to reach for higher and higher goals. That's not a grab for prize money by professional riders. Because along with that comes lower entry fees for, for lower level folks. But we believe there needs to be a design that somebody who is in the children's jumper wants to push up and go into the juniors and go into the medium juniors and then go up into the high juniors and then try to go up into international competition. And we ultimately believe that we want a very successful high end of the sport because I can tell you that I believe that when Tiger Woods is winning in golf, all around the country in every golf club there are people coming out and taking lessons and starting to learn and and play play golf so we want stars in the sport and with the high end to be very successful because it feeds the grassroots level um, and along with that we fundamentally think it's a mistake in the united states that we don't have real national championships it's the only place in the in the world where real north american championships but you know we have one a couple you know two three years ago before that it was five years ago where every year there's, you know, when we send somebody to the Olympics, we send five people. But if you have a national championship, there's 100 people or 80 people that get to go try and ride in a championship format and try to be successful. So, you know, we need to get back to where every, at least, you know, if not every year or every two years, we are teaching our folks and, and a, a lot of them how to ride in championships. And the same goes for young riders. You know, we commend the Federation for the Young Rider Championships, but it, it's, it's weak right now. It, it's not, it, it doesn't have the honor and recognition that everybody is dying to, to go there, and it's mostly because there isn't a young rider division that feeds 
into that, or where it, there is in, in Europe. So, you know, we you know we want to support the federation in, in the development of young rider championships as well. So th those are just examples. But if I had to categorize the three areas: clean sport without unintended consequences, balance of power, and sit in a system that encourages growth. And I'll cover off the first one, and then we'll um, talk. Some of the other board members will talk about the others. First one is our relationship with the FBI. And these next ones, I'm telling you these, you may know about them, and I apologize if I repeat myself, but we believe we need to educate everybody to make sure they're aware. And the first one is the FBI decided this year that they were going to enter, that they had relationships with different rider groups around the world. They were going to eliminate that, and they were going to go to enter into a memorandum of understanding with specific groups. And in this particular case, it would be the International Jumper Riders Club would represent all riders in the world. We in North American Riders Group didn't like that, and we, we pushed back. We, we think the IJRC is a, a great organization, but they're not here. They're a, a, they're, you know, it's, it's not purposeful, but they operate out of Western Europe, and their focus is on Western Europe. But we have our own issues that need to be dealt with, so we have pushed the FBI pretty hard to let NARG enter into a memorandum of understanding, and we're in that debate. We're negotiating with the IJRC of how we can get our voice so that you know we're not just heard at the federation level here, but internationally. Um, other things um, along with that is you know board representation on the IJRC. Katie Prudent has done a great job representing us for the last few years. Thank you, Katie, very much. And I think going forward, Kent Parrington will be um, representing NARG on the, the IJRC. So we appreciate you volunteering for that, Kent. A couple other little things with the FBI. You ought to know this year for showing FBI, two yellow cards and you're suspended for six months. It's a new rule, brand new. It doesn't take much to get, get a yellow card. NARG and the IJRC are trying to push back on what are the definitions of that, that it's not just a you know, an angry steward that day that, that can take you out of your profession for, for a long period of time. But, you know, be a little careful with it because the yellow card's serious. Um, FBI wild cards, you ought to know it if you want to compete internationally and you're having a hard time because your world ranking isn't at the right place. For every Grand Prix around the world, um, major Grand Prix around the world, the FBI has two wild cards. You can, you can appeal directly to the FBI um, to get an opportunity to compete at an event. So it's not just send in the application, You and there are a number of riders from North America who are doing that now, but just know that opportunity exists for you. And I already talked about the, the separate um, North American issues, but that's just an example of one thing that we are doing to make sure that what we hear here is represented on an international level. Um, another hot topic, um, that has huge implications as Hind Boots, and to talk about that is Norma Delano. Okay. Thank you. Uh, when I went to the uh, Hind Boots meeting in Lausanne, I was surprised to find a well organized group headed by two French vets asking the FBI for a total ban of Hind Boots. Uh, performance enhancing boots. These vets had slides and films of horses competing in an exaggerated style of jumping. Uh, their case was based on the premise that hind boots tend to give horses four backs as well as to shorten their competitive careers. They also made their case that use of hind boots would affect breeding in a negative way as they give a false impression of horses' natural jumping characteristics. I argued with them and pointed out that there is not any evidence that currently legal boots when used in, as intended and placed properly on the leg are either misleading or harmful. Now that this technology has been developed, the consequences of a ban will for sure lead to real abuse both at home and in the practice area. The key to me is to educate riders, trainers, grooms, and stewards and to develop a fair system of penalty in cases of abuse. Having boots that are under a certain weight without interior irritants and placed on the leg as the manufacturers intended should be our goal. 
as long as course designers ask for what is not natural and somewhat against nature, there must be a regulated balance in order to answer the questions being asked of all of us. In the end, it was decided to do further research in order to arrive at that balance. Uh, the next slide. Now, as, as far as four shows regulating vaccinations, independent from our federation or the FBI, the experts I've spoken to feel that this can produce a more dangerous climate in many ways. Vets and experts in that field should do the regulating, and we will be lobbying for that. So I'd like to introduce Chris to talk about Mark's influence in the Federation. Thank you, Norman. Uh, last year, I reported on the restructuring of the United States Hunter Jumper Association, and uh, it was really laid the groundwork for the uh, changes uh, of the uh, USEF Federation this year. And we don't want to get into a lot of the nitty gritty details, but probably the most significant change was the board of directors went from 54 seats to 19, and I think that's significant. Uh, next slide. This slide will show you the flow chart of how the 19 members are made up. You'll see there's three councils, the International Disciplines Council, the National Breeds and Disciplines Council, the Administration and Finance Council. You also have four athletes and then officers of the Federation. Next slide. I think everyone can see the benefits that this new structure, streamlined structure, has. This has taken a lot of the special interests and created a fully engaged leadership team. Uh, with that in place, with these governance, with the USHJA, the USEF, I think the last most important piece of the puzzle is searching for the new CEO. Murray has graciously accepted the position of being the chair of the search committee for a new CEO. And we are <laughs> we are hopeful that he will find the visionary leader for our sport at this very critical time. Very good luck. <laughs> Next slide. Um, although NARC has pushed hard for change, we're not really taking credit for those changes at the Federation level, but what I want you to see here is how much we are taking advantage trying to capitalize on all these new changes. You can see that uh, Murray Kessler, BZ Matt, and myself as NAR board members, we are now on the USEF Board of Directors. You'll also see stars next to the names who actually have hunter jumper, you know, direct hunter jumper connection, their history, part of our sport. And you also have two crossover candidates with uh, Chester Weber and Tucker Johnson. They're driving, but they also have great interest in hunter jumper. So you'll see just in this group, we have almost nine of the 17 board seats, and uh, I think that could be really helpful in a lot of things we're trying to work on. Next slide. Um, yes, this one also shows the different councils, and again, more uh, our members who are on the different uh, councils of the, of the organization. Um, I have to say, five years later, we're still here as NARG, and uh, we really we continue to ask for help. Um, everyone's always asking what you can do for help, how you can help us, and we, we need help. We need help you know, in the form of membership, we need help in the form of uh, funding. Um, I think we also need people who really want to participate actively in the leadership of our sport. Um, we also need people who are willing to spend time uh, filling out the detailed show evaluations. You'll see easy later talking about the top 25 and how much time and effort goes into that. As Murray said, it's really had beneficial results on the shows in America. And I think most of all, each and one of us, each and every one of us individually in this wild and crazy horseshoe atmosphere that we're in. Just need to bring our best horsemanship game to the day, you know, game every day to the horse shows at home when you're working around horses. I think that's just what we can do really importantly. 
Um, last slide six. Um, no meeting would be complete without mention of the mileage rule. And uh, I am sad to say that this is still probably our biggest disappointment. We really have very little progress to report on this. However, we're hopeful with a new CEO, a new focused board of directors, we can address the major issues of our sport. So that's really my report. Thank you very much. And to present the top 25, our superstar of America, BZ Madden. <laughs> to the organizers and also provide a friendly competition amongst the horse shows. Uh, in our first year we created a quantitative questionnaire and have each year since that looked for ways to improve on it. Um, we feel this project has helped all of us as exhibitors by raising the standards of the shows and also helping us to decide which shows we choose to support. Uh, basically you can think of it as an ours version of consumer reports. Besides benefiting exhibitors, the top 25 has also helped many of our horse shows. Most show managers have embraced the process and benefited from the friendly dialogue. The smart ones have actually used it as a marketing tool or even as a leverage to get approval for major, major improvements at their show. Another benefit is that we have, we and all of our evaluators have also become better educated on the intricacies of running a horse show through our dialogue we have become as much aware of some of the horse show managers' problems as they have of ours. Um, through all these benefits, increased competition, communication between exhibitors and show managers, the measurable improvements in the show quality, and increased education, the NARC Top 25 has led to our mutual goal of achieving better sport in our industry. Uh, these are just some examples of some of the improvements uh, we've seen throughout the years. Thunderbird, uh, who's always scored high, has upgraded to a three-star. They have improved, they've improved their footing in their secondary rings and schooling areas. Spruce Meadows, every year continues to improve uh, more prize money, uh, more uh, places for the sponsors to view from, and every year we go there, there's something new. The goal got huge investments in, in uh, the venue, their prize money increased, media and promotion increased, and so as did their spectator base and VIP area. The Royal, all, always making improvements. They're one of the few that have really used the, our evaluation sheet to, they've studied it and tried to figure out how to actually improve on their score. New Albany, a uh, huge improvement with their sit field in 2012, and some major improvements in stabling in 2013. And, and Jalapa, which, for those of you who don't know, is in Mexico, and this year is coming very important to all of us in North America, Canada, Mexico, U.S., because it's going to be a host a Nations Cup final, uh, or not a final, a Nations Cup qualifier for the Kudasi in the final in Barcelona, Spain. Um, and I think they also said they were going to have a $250,000 Grand Prix as well this year. Uh, this is just some examples of how some of the shows have, have actually used the NAR Top 25 to promote their show. Uh, Spruce Meadows is right on the prize list. Um, the Royals said they actually used it as a tool to secure a spot for NBC Sports. And uh, you can see Thunderbird, they use it in just about every ad I've seen. <laughs> and earlier I said that we um, each year have made improvements to our evaluation form. This year we changed the standards for the prize money. Only the total jumper prize money was counted. Um, this included rider bonuses, special prizes, and also it took 500,000 or more in total prize money to get a score of five, which is the maximum score in that category. And it also took 300,000 to score a five, which again is the maximum score for prize money in the Grand Prix. And then new this year also was a 10 point bonus for a Grand Prix prize money of 500,000 or more and 10 bonus points if the event was uh, approved by the FBI. And lastly, when we scored the variety of classes, we only considered off, uh, classes offered in the jumper division. 
In 2013, we evaluated over 44 major events. All of them are listed here on the sheet. <clears throat> Before I get to the top 25, I'd like to start by recognizing our top three events in the category of specialty equestrian events. Actually, the top four events. <laughs> we had the Trump Invitational as a new event this year, uh, or sorry, last year. Um, although it uh, it was marred by some bad footing where it was a fantastic event otherwise and we're happy to say that that was remedied soon after the event. The Live Oak Invitational, it's a beautiful venue in Ocala, Florida for none of you that have been there. It's, it was the home of an international driving event for many years and we are very fortunate that all the organizers Chester Weber and Juliet Reed have added the international show jump into their roster of events. And finally, all right, also the American Invitational, such a classic in our show jumping tour. And thank you to Michael Morrissey and Stadium Jumping for keeping that event alive. And uh, it's always been an event I think every young rider dreams about getting an invitation to. And finally, as the winner this year, second year running, the New Albany Classic. This category was created because these events have only one or maybe very few classes, and they have a huge disadvantage in our top 25 scoring. But even with that, New Albany scored, with their score of 88%, would have scored sixth in our top 25. Um, but we do have this category because these, these specialty events, they focus on quality and we wanted to reward that. So I, I know uh, the Wexners have created in New Albany the perfect formula for giving us as competitors a fantastic competition and using it as a backdrop to raise over a million dollars each year <coughs> for the Center of Family Safety and Healing. They have family activities and entertainment starting at 10 a.m. and by 2 o'clock when the Grand Prix begins, there are more than 10,000 spectators there to watch. And Abigail Wexner is not able to be here today, but I believe, uh, maybe Matt, are you accepting for? Michael was supposed to be here. I think. He had some issues, I can't. <laughs> Show manager Matt Morrissey can yep. accept for me. <laughs> Scored quite high. 
uh, Hampton Classic, one of our top events in the United States. Unfortunately, struggling a little with their grass field, but we've already had some dialogue with them that they are really on top of it. They've had a lot of things happening there to fix it. So hopefully next year we're going to be it'll be quite high in our standings. Devon, fantastic event for our sport. Uh, it has great history. It's it's our highest ranked national event actually on our list. Uh, again, missing the FBI bonus and still scoring 85 percent. The atmosphere, the crowds, the country fair. Uh, it can't be beat. It's just fantastic for our sport. Into the top five. Alltech National Horse Show. This has been top five in our rankings since its beginning. The Alltech Arena has provided a great indoor venue for the National Horse Show. The prize money, world ranking classes, uh, World Cup qualifiers all highlight the jumper competitions. And the exhibitor, exhibitor hospitality and social calendar are unique. And all these things, along with the increased spectator base, have made it mm -hmm. our, our top five event. Number four, the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair. Uh, again, these organizers have used the evaluation list uh, wisely, and uh, they, they know how to step up their score. Um, but really, the show has all the ingredients for a top show. Good footing, top prize money, world ranking classes, a packed house almost every night and uh, international riders and the Royal Winter Fair as well happening along with it. It's, it's a fantastic event. And number three, the American Gold Cup. And while we're on this, we're gonna, I'd like to present, <coughs> moving up from number 12 to number three, we'd like to recognize the American Gold Cup as our 2013 most improved event. is a huge jump uh, from their first year in a, in a new venue in 2012 since then they've made several big improvements increased prize money increased world ranking classes improved ceremonies and presentation improved promotion and media coverage it was both live cast and broadcast on NBC Sports um, and a lot, all of that brought along a big increase in spectator base albeit bringing a little bit of a parking problem, but that'll be, <laughs> that, that's a good problem. And uh, here, here to accept the award is, again, <laughs> show managers Matt Morrissey and also Alan Beach. Uh, Derby Series, 
Um, new hosting facilities, they hosted not one but two Nations Cups this year. Um, they've become a part of the newly developed Rolex Grand Slam of show jumping, and their ability to secure sponsors is just unparalleled. They, uh, with CN going out, they announced last year at the Masters the, as the new sponsor of the Grand Prix for 1.5 million Canadian Pacific. I can personally say that Spruce Meadows has been a huge help in my career, and I think it's also been a big reason for the success of many of the North American riders we have, some of whom are here tonight, in our sport today. Spruce Meadows provides everything that NARG is hoping for from a competition. Top sport, media to promote the sport, fans to watch and get hooked on the sport, sponsors to support the sport, fantastic venues with great footing, and all this combined with a place for our young horses and our young students to get the experience competing at an international level. All this was a vision of one, and I say this with, with uh, great fondness, hard-headed and determined couple, Rahan and, Mark, Rahan and Mark Southern. Um, we owe them and the Spruce Meadows family of staff, volunteers, spons and sponsors a big thank you. For many years, they have welcomed me to Spruce Meadows, and now it is my honor to welcome them and among his many other titles, Spruce Meadows co-chairman Ron Southern to accept the award. Beasy. Thank you, Murray. Uh, this is uh, so meaningful to Mark and I, uh, to Linda, uh, Nancy, and now I'm so proud to have young Ben here with us from our family in what is becoming a generational tradition. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you so much for this award. I am most impressed, and I mean that genuinely, uh, with the work that you've done here in your in NARC to not only do this in the United States, but to bring Mexico and Canada into it. But I think the thing that you'll allow me to digress a little bit, when these reports come out, I know that it's Bruce Meadows, it's like the auditor's report. <laughs> the, uh, and indeed, that's how the items are taped, they're treated. When Linda's going over her, her budgets, her capex budgets and operational budgets, top of the list are the recommendations of your committee. And why, excuse me, and why wouldn't they be? You've experienced it, both good and bad, throughout your careers and around the world. And when you come to a venue and say it would be better if you did it this way, of course it would be, or at least in the vast majority of cases it would be. And where can you get that? Only from you. And to have the foresight to establish this organization to do that will not only, I can tell you, it's, it's helped us immensely, but I think you, there'll be others who will be your winners in the future. The, um, and that's how it should be. Because what you're doing, 
And I know that uh, Linda often says this, Ben, I mean, if, if you're going to have sport competition, you have to, at the top, really put it on well if you want the horses and the riders to improve, to get better. The same thing applies to venues, ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me. You know, I'll we'll just rest here for a minute. Um, no, that's a good thing. Um, if you don't, if you don't strive, it's like, it's like your own career, everything that you do, you know that. And, uh, but to have an organization of respect, which you represent, not only provide the recommendations, but do it in such a graceful and considerate manner, that is very, very unique. And I'm sure that every one of the tournaments gradually in the East is, what's happening? <laughs> Somebody just shot me. <laughs> I feel uh, that I'm a friend with each of you, and 
uh, you know, I, what I meant is that not everybody is able to participate to the same degree. But one of the remarkable things about Swiss Meadows, and looking back on it, is uh, how many people have helped Swiss Meadows in small and large ways alike. Uh, not so many on the large, because it's, you know, it's, people aren't there all the time. Uh, how many of you were in the writers' meeting when I talked about the Wolverine? Uh -huh. Well, this will give you a good example of how people contribute. Uh, many athletes have arrived at Swiss Meadows with a a reputation for being troublemakers or uh, having certain personal habits that uh, might not be with you, right? So on uh, one of the writers' meetings, uh, were you there, Mario? I told them about, uh, about a, a, a particular animal that lives in the north of uh, Canada uh, called the Wolverine. Uh, he is really a very different thing. Uh, very ferocious, has a huge hunting area, and whenever he comes across a cabin, a, a, a miner's cabin or uh, a native cabin, uh, they have very large claws and they know there's food there. They break into the cabins, they take everything. In Russia, this same animal exists, it's known as the button. So the glutton, he eats everything there. And then, before he leaves, I use the right word. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll use the The glutton, the wolverine, after he's eaten everything, he pees all over, he urinates all over the, the whole cabin, and uh, makes it uninhabitable for anyone else after. <laughs> That's true. When I told that to the uh, riders, I got a great reaction. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, occasionally a wolverine shows up at Spin Santos <laughs> and they hear that story and uh, and I, I can tell you that uh, the behavior of, and the uplift that those very people who bring this Swiss Meadows is remarkable to me. Uh, and that's what I mean, that people in small and large ways uh, uh, can help our venue, can help our sport. The, uh, <coughs> it's also true, Murray asked me if I'd just make a few comments. <laughs> and I'm starting to run out of <laughs> Swiss Meadows is a totally unlikely thing to do. It's an unlikely sport, an unlikely place, and we started 40 years ago. Uh, I wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't think of any of us, uh, Mary, from a business standpoint, would have given much of a, of any uh, opportunity to success in when you look at it that way. But um, it was founded on actually based on family values. The same thing that your mother and father taught you. The, uh, and it, you know, in these, in these days, these things kind of slide, slide away and uh, you don't remember it so much. And in your heart and your mind, I think you carry it with you. It's, uh, you don't have to have a lecture on what is the right thing to do in a family. And if you do that in a, your business or in your sport, which is your business, uh, I think you will find, uh, as the shadow is starting to lengthen like you do for me now, I think you'll be able to look back 
with a great deal of what, what is the happiness? We all check out in the end. So what is it that you look back on and feel in here good about? I think what you will find is it's like I'm being a preacher now. The uh, things that you learned that your parents teach that you know are right and apply that to your relationships with other people, your enterprise and your endeavor, I think you will find <coughs> that that will give you great satisfaction in your lives and <coughs> in a way I also think it affects your success. Um, a few last things. In running an organization, and an organization can be a rider, a trainer, or an owner, it's certainly a venue. Um, judgment, judgment that I've been talking about is a fine thing. But it isn't all that uncommon. What is uncommon, and is far rarer, is deep insight. To see what the judgments that you're making today are in fact, in fact, in all probability, give you the results that you want at the end. And that takes what I call insight. It's a little different than judgment. I think most of us are pretty good with our judgments. But there's another step there, ladies and gentlemen, that I commend to you, particularly if you're a tournament organizer. Those judgments will affect what the long term is. And, uh, and uh, you can back that up with You can back that up with uh, what's needed uh, in a VZ uh, for the organizers that you speak to. Uh, you need simple plans that are easily communicated to everybody. You need determined execution. And you need a standard of excellence that it's so easy to talk about. I spent three days in a hotel room in, uh, coming back from Australia one time uh, trying to work on my definition of excellence. And, uh, maybe, you, maybe you're aware of it. Maybe not. But for me, and I think you may want to look at it this way yourself. Excellence is going far beyond what anyone ever thought would do. Excellence is having the highest standards and always striving for them. Excellence is paying attention to the smallest detail My gosh, I look out here and I see so many people there. And excellence is caring. If you put all those together and you do it for a period of time in an organization, whether it be a railroad, whether it be a pharmaceutical company, whatever it might be, if you in fact over a period of time have people start to believe that definition of excellence, after a while, maybe it takes as long as a decade or so, you don't have to talk about excellence. Everybody brings excellence as just a matter of the way that they work, the way that they think, to what they do. So I think that uh, the, um, what you're doing with the, uh, the venues, what you need to talk about oh, Devin, that's such great, great tournaments. You, you know, look at, look at the changes that have happened here. Look at the changes that uh, happened in the other. You are the ones that are stimulating that excellence in them. 
And I think they say you want to. Uh, just like you want to. So, uh, I'd leave you with a last thought. In business, we often, and we're going to tell you, many of you know, uh, and well, we often talk about uh, goals or objectives, but sometimes we talk about dreams. People use that, but it's the same. You, know, you can have a goal, you can have an objective, and a dream. Uh, but um, a dream is never just a dream. It's a wish to take the things that you love and appreciate and apply them to the world to help to change the world, your world. That's the same in business with a goal or an objective. And I think when you look on that that way, you can imagine the organizers for NARD sitting down saying, we've got to find a way to get this improved. A goal, an objective, or a dream. And I believe, ladies and gentlemen, if I was fortunate enough to sit with you 10 years from now, you'll be so happy to do that. Because I think you already see huge progress. And that, and that dream, that goal, that objective will continue to unfold for the total benefit of our sport. Thank you so much again. The applicant must be a current NARD member and a citizen of North America. They should demonstrate an intention to be a lifelong participant in the sport and also have financial need. In the last two years, the riders that have won this award have gone on to use this grant to further their development in the sport of show jumping. Each year, it is very difficult to pick just one rider. Actually, the first year in 2012, we picked a first and a second place winner. The board puts a lot of time into going through all our applications. I want to emphasize to the riders, please don't get discouraged if you don't win this award. We put a lot of time into it, and just because you may not have won it one year, we can still pick you the next year. We will continue to evaluate your applications. At this time, actually, I'd like to announce that the Southern and Hancock families have committed to three more years of sponsoring and supporting this award. We would like to thank them for their ongoing support 
that without them this might not be possible. So without further delay, I'd like to call up the winner of the 2014 NARB Riders Grant, Anita Mont. Again, we'd like to congratulate Anita, and at this time, I'm going to turn the mic over to Murray Kessler. I just have a real quick one. We have the election for a few on there. So, um, it has been updated. All the candidates received over 96% of the vote. So, um, elected for a new three year term are McLean Ward, Jimmy Toronto, Norman Della Joya, and um, Missy, welcome to the I'd like to ask McLean to, to come up and wrap the meeting up, but just on a personal level, I've only been coming to this for, for the last three or four years. It's been a joy. It has helped catapult our, our daughter. She wouldn't have gotten to where she was without going to Spruce Meadows and and experiencing that kind of competition and, and true grit and, and, and that. It, it's just a, a joy we look forward to every year. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Well, tonight's uh, meeting's moving along nicely. Sometimes it gets a little, uh, a little long-winded. Uh, So good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm here to speak a little bit about uh, about the future, uh, not only what our mission statement is, but what our plans are, and recap this, uh, this evening's meeting uh, to some degree. Uh, you can see our mission statement here. Uh, it's been uh, touched on several times throughout the evening. Uh, it is very fitting when talking about our group's mission, for that matter, the mission of everybody who takes the time to show up in this room that we were able to hear Mr. Southern speak tonight. I have to say, I'm always amazed when I hear you, you speak, or anybody in your organization, in your family, Mr. Southern, uh, with what you've built, not only in business, uh, but in, in sport. Uh, humble, open-mindedness, always looking to change, and, and it's very clear when, when all of us hear you speak, why Spruce Meadows and what you've done is such a success. So, my hat's off to you. Mr. Southern and his family have put into practice, and, and it's Mr. and Mrs. Southern because Mrs. Southern is just as much a driving force. <laughs> so, uh, the Southerns have put into practice the ideals we all, whether you be an athlete, an owner, a trainer, an event organizer, or any other position related to our sport. Through it all, Spruce Meadows has held fast to the ideals of sport first, and clearly shown that it can be done successfully for all the parties involved. To be honest, probably more successfully than any other event in the world. We often run into to the conflict between different areas in, in running of horse events, tournaments, horse shows here in the United States. What are the needs of the riders, the owners, the managers? What are the goals of these parties? And, and Spruce Meadows really shows that, that all these needs can be met and be met uh, incredibly successfully. While reflecting on what I wanted to say to recap and, re and conclude tonight's meeting, it dawned on me that all of us, all of us in this sport, no matter what facet of it, of it we occupy, want to build and create something better. We forget this. None of us are simply trying to just get through our day. If that were the case, we would not have chosen this career path. <laughs> we all want to improve and make our sport our industry and our profession be the best it can be. 
It made me realize that without question, we all really do have a common goal. And we need to work together to make it happen. Too often, we work against each other. Managers against riders, trainers against managers. We know all the scenarios. To be able to take the sport throughout North America to the lofty heights that we all hope our events aspire to, we must work to find solutions to produce financially viable, sponsor and media friendly, and horseman smart events. We have seen a great resurgence in the past few years of many events such as Devon, the American Gold Cup, and Del Mar. We have also seen an incredible new events which have set their sights very high. Live Oak, Sacramento, the Alltech National Horse Show. We at NARG, as you have heard tonight, take great pride in the efforts that have encouraged improvements, and we are very proud to support and promote these events. Horsemen and event organizers alike must understand the other's needs, find compromise where possible, and share a common vision of where we want our sport to go in the future. We also need all the North American federations to step up and be an equal, unbiased voice for the horse, the athlete, and the events alike. This has changed in recent years. We, we've known of the changes here in the United States with the structure of the federation, and, and the association was founded as, as a horse show association. And this has evolved on paper, but not necessarily in practice. Uh, and we at NARG, and I think a lot of us in the sport, with new leadership, with Christine on board, looking for a new CEO, uh, are, are hoping that this will become a practice. Their standards must be consistent for all parties of interest, and they alone are the single most influential voice in the future of our sport. We at NARG feel that this new era in place, our voice is being heard as a voice of reason. As NARG looks to the future, we will continue to work for the betterment of the sport for all. We will continue to work on our target objectives, such as you've seen tonight, the mileage rule, never ending, cost and quality controls, affordable young horse programs, and the hotbed issues, such as the ones we've discussed earlier tonight. We will also continue to stay ever more active on committees throughout the world to ensure that the voice of North America is heard and the needs of our sport at home are met. Reality is though, to do this, we need your help. Our board can give our time, our ideas, our visions, but we also need your ideas and your support. Only as a group can we move forward together. Separate, we will certainly drift apart. As we have seen from NARG, from NARG's number one event for the fifth year in a row, Spruce Meadows, it can be done. We can continue to build a strong industry for all by holding steadfast to the ideas of horsemanship and sport. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to just thank a few sponsors here this evening. Uh, you just give me a moment here. I'm going to have a list. And uh, like we said, every bit of support we get is NAR. Uh, goes a long way. This is, uh, takes a lot of organization and a lot of help. Uh, we definitely appreciate all of that. Equine Tack and Nutritional, uh, Taylor Harris Insurance, also all of our founding members, all of our uh, great contributors, can't thank you guys enough. Many of the faces we see in this room uh, are here every year and you've stood behind us and uh, we truly do appreciate your efforts. Uh, so now we're going to open up the room to some question and answer. There's some microphones here. Uh, we welcome your questions. It always uh, provides for a nice discussion. And uh, please, let us know your thoughts. Everybody goes on a minute to talk to someone after, but I'd like to know more about the vaccination ruling because I do think there's some consistencies. 
no one was going to be so good or not. You know. Maybe you should put the... Put the yeah, I can talk about it a little bit, too. I talked to Sonia King this morning, General Counsel of uh, the Federation. We, the issue with the, the vaccinations is that, you know, you read the text of the slides, if you actually follow the rules of individual managers, all trying to do a good thing, did, it actually weakens the, immunity, yeah. the immune systems of the, the horses. It's, and in some cases, it's actually against FDI rules because you're not allowed to compete within certain amounts of time that are being required by competition. So you can end up vaccinating every 30 to 45 days. Um, the veterinary committee is working on it. Um, as an immediate need, they're, they're trying to negotiate with um, the hits, horse shows, and Tom um, to, to change those rules as, as we speak, because that's sort of one of the managers that's been really pushing it the hardest. But um, we're looking, you know, I'm not going to put you on the spot, Christine, but I, I, I know that Dr. Schumacher and others are, are looking at it. But He's we think that there needs to be a proposal on that. Everybody can't come up with their own. I mean, there, there are, there's a lot of science behind when is the right time and how often to vaccinate. And, and I think it's been pretty well documented and proven that doing it more frequently isn't going to have any impact on the concerns that, that organizers have. It just makes the horses more fun. So it's an area we're, we're pushing on and, and you've got the president of the federation sitting behind you and she's shaking her head yes that they're, they're working on. Yeah, I spoke to Dr. Schumacher this afternoon, and he is going to come up with a proposal that will uh, serve all show managements, you know, that they can follow the guidelines and do the best we can for the health of the horses. Yeah. Thank you. I'll tell you on the, you know, on my own personal feeling, I think we have actually an opportunity to make meaningful ground on the mileage rule this year. If, if you, it wasn't lost on you. Almost half the votes on the board are folks from our, our sport. That, so it's a, it's a radical change. Um, now I can tell you NARC has no desire to just force something through that doesn't work for organizers, et cetera. Our, our point of view, and we'll be pushing through some of us that are members of the board to get a group of organizers together and managers and trainers and, and try to work out a, a solution. But there are there are real needs. There have to be limits and uh, what I call balance, right? I mean, if you know, if Rolex isn't going to allow, or Longines isn't going to allow a Rolex event at a World Cup qualifier at WEF, there needs to be World Cup qualifiers in South Florida. There needs to be freedom to, to have competition. There needs to be some regulators on pricing. It can't be anything. You know, I mean, it, they're, they're, you know, at some point you're going to be paying, you know, huge amounts of money with no justification. That's what a monopoly is, and I told you in the, the past I've had a lot of experience with antitrust. Does that mean we not don't want people to make money and to have great competition? I Personally, I would tell you that I think WEF at this point is uh, the show most in the United States that has nothing to worry about about um, competition. I mean, it, could it create some additional events down here? This horse show is well established with a well established infrastructure. It's going to be great. It just is. Um, but on the other hand, you might be able to have a big World Cup qualifier in Miami Stadium at the same time and, and other events. So um, that's a, an example. And I don't re need me to repeat it, but you know, some of the things that you heard these guys said, they're, you know, they're quietly working. What Norman did for you at the FBI on Hein Booth could cost people in this room hundreds of thousands of dollars on the value of their horses if there was a complete ban and have complete unintended consequences. You know, it, it's a huge issue. What Katie's done working with the International Jumper Riders Club, fighting and giving her time to, to, you know, to fight for our issues and, you know, what, what, what each of them does. So we need your support and we need your, your help. Any other questions? Thanks for your support for the North American Rhymes Group. Thanks for having us.